First, I want to thank uh, those of you who've been here for the last couple weeks for taking this journey with me through uh, discussing and looking at how do we as a church respond to the challenge of poverty. The number of you who have been reading this book, uh, Toxic Charity, with me, I greatly appreciate. And to recap for those of us who are jumping in here, uh, what we've been looking at is the way that um, poverty in America, if you think it's a problem, it's worse than you think it is. It's a far greater problem than we often acknowledge. And, and the response that we have to this poverty is often a type of charity where we give without any strings attached. We write a check and walk away. And this, this type of charity is not really making much of a difference in that it is teaching people to be beggars. And so we started looking at that. Last week we looked at the way that our goals are different than the goals of, of a, a local government. The local government is seeking to save tax dollars and minimize problems for its citizens. And so, for example, we used Utah. Utah is giving free apartments to anyone who's chronically homeless, and that saves tax dollars. But that's not quite what we're looking to do here because we don't see people as problems. We see people as guests, guests to invite to share this table with us. And so this week, we're going to how do we be neighbors? How do we be neighbors? We've, we've, we've set up the problem. We've talked about how uh, we're, we're inviting guests, not trying to solve problems. And today we're looking at how do we be neighbors to others? It's, and this idea of being neighborly, it's something... It, 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 that phrase shows up so many times in Scripture, it gets almost a little bit uh, hackneyed. But it's what we read about when uh, we talk about the greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. When Paul needs to write and give advice to one of the earliest churches, Paul's the guy who starts most of the early churches, and he has to write and give advice to one of them. At one of the earliest letters he writes to the church of Galatia, he says, everything you need to know about the law can be summed up with this one commandment. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor is one of the phrases that runs throughout scripture and it is an enduring reality that some of our neighbors will always live in poverty. That, that's how it is, right? It is what uh, Jesus says, we read in John 12, you will always have the poor with you. Your neighbor, you will always have neighbors who are poor. And, and that's a, a verse that I have heard used to excuse not getting involved, you know, you're always going to have the poor, so why bother doing anything about it? Even Jesus said, you're always going to have a poor, why, why bother trying to change that? Except that kind of misses how Jesus is quoting this scripture. When, when a Jewish person quotes scripture, they'll give you the first part of the verse and assume you know the rest. Um, you know, and, and I say something like, I pledge allegiance... Exactly. That's, that's the type of thing Jesus is doing here. He says, you'll always have the poor with you. Let me give you the rest of it that, that everyone who was hearing that would have, would have heard. It's Deuteronomy 15. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, there will always be poor. Therefore, open your hand to the poor and needy in your land. Jesus is not saying there will always be poor, so just give up. Jesus is saying there will always be poor, and the rest of the verse is, so always be opening your hand to help them. And so Jesus is not being defeatist. He's is setting us up for a lifetime of being involved with that. And so we look at what the Bible has to say about poverty. And we, what we start finding is that it looks at it differently than we look at it often today. For example, when the Bible talks about poverty, it does not see poverty as a moral problem. We often look down on people who are in poverty because they must have done something immoral or wrong or stupid. And... Uh, then you reread the book of Job. You know the book of Job, right? Job has a very bad day, and then the next day is worse, and the day after that gets even worse, and he loses his farm, his cattle, all of his family, they're all gone. And then three friends show up to pile on and say, Job, you must have done something wrong, immoral, evil. You repent and God will make it all right. And, and Job says, no, I, I didn't do anything wrong. And then they go on for 30 chapters like this. This is one of the books of the Bible I wish was about half as long. It gets a little bit old after a while. But they just keep on arguing about this. I didn't do anything wrong. And in the end, when Job shows up, God says, he's right. He didn't do anything wrong. And you three friends are trying to tell him that he's in poverty because he did something wrong. You better beg for his forgiveness. And so we see st stuff like that in the Bible where sometimes poverty has nothing to do with whether someone has been moral or not. Sometimes it just happens. 
The Bible further goes and, and establishes a way for those in power to listen to those in poverty. There is a mechanism in the Bible that comes up again and again for the way those in authority can listen. And the mechanism is called the prophets. The prophets are the people who show up at the edge of a community and, and yell to the center, to the kings, to the mayors, to the governors, yell to the center, look over here. You think you're living great over here, but look here. Look how your society is functioning for the people on the margins, the people on the edge, the people blue collar working for a living, calluses on their hands. Look at how this is treating them. And so the Bible, the prophet Amos is an example of this. He points out how at that time, about 600 BC, everything was going great for the people, the merchants, the, the rulers, but the, the people on the edges, he, what he says is their, their heads were being ground under the heels of the rich. And so the Bible not only says more, uh, poverty is not a moral issue, it says that uh, we need to make sure that if we have power, we are listening to those on the edges so that we know how our culture is working for everyone, not just for the people who have money and, and property. And finally, the, the, in our little review here of what the Bible tells us about poverty, the Bible gives us a mechanism for addressing poverty on a regular basis. It gives us the year of the Jubilee. Y'all, who here has heard of that phrase, year of Jubilee? You're, okay, some people. Um, the year of Jubilee is this idea. Every 50 years, you hit the reset button. Your land, your family land, you can mess up, you can sell it, you can lose it, you can be a bum, but no more than 50 years from then, all land reverts to the original family. And so, you can mess up, and you can suffer for your own mistakes, but your children won't. Your grandchildren will not be doomed to poverty due to the mistakes of the prior generations. And so every, every family will have a place to stay and good work to do. And so this is kind of what the Bible starts to lay out about what we think about poverty. And it would be wonderful if we could just take that and just move it up to today and just apply it evenly. But we do have some challenges, right? We don't live in, in 3rd century B.C. Israel. We live in 21st century America. And so we face challenges that the Bible doesn't directly address. For example, we have a class system in America. It's not something we talk about often, but it's there, right? We have a class system in America based upon people with different skills, different values, different tastes, different priorities. And I'll tell you about, a little bit about it in a second, but first I need to say, I dare to talk about it mostly so that we can confess how we've used it to judge others. Because that's how it is used. We judge people based upon their class, but we don't talk about it. But it's there. We live in a, in a culture where to be middle class is to know things like to know what type of, what brand of clothing to buy. The middle class about having nice things, knowing how to order in a good restaurant talking to your kids about going to college and then being able to save to make that happen, using money to handle the future, having an understanding that the future is something we can control by our decisions. Families in middle class tend to be based around the father and any disagreements are based around sitting, are, are solved by sitting down and working through them. That's kind of middle class living in America today. And that's very different than, than those living in poverty, those living in lower class. Those living in poverty, they know things like how to move in one day. Anyone here, could you move in one day? Yeah, that's terrifying to think about, isn't it? But it, when, you live in a top, when you live in a way such that your way, where you're living is that up in the air, you can move in one day, things are transitory, but people are important. You hold on to people, because people are what matters. People in the sort of poverty, they know how to get your, their family members out of jail, and probably have know how to keep their clothes from being stolen at a laundromat, know how to live without a checking account, and then spend every dollar on today because that's, that's what they got, enough dollars for today, why would they be able to have more? People in lower class tend to believe in fate because they can't control it, might as well endure it, and the families tend to be matriarchal, mother-focused, with conflicts resolved through violence, and that, that's what we see today. And what happens is, if you are in poverty long enough, it begins to damage people. It begins to warp people. It begins to lead to people who have a complete distrust of authority, a cynicism that anything can ever go right, because it never does. 
And it leads to men who cannot provide for their families because jobs aren't stable and so families start to fracture because men move around either in search of job or give up having a job. And so you end up fractured with fractured families and not enough time to raise children well. But that's kind of what begins to happen in America when, when, in those in poverty. And we can quantify what that looks like, how much, of a cha how much that challenges people. There's a book called Scarcity that lays out when you are under a condition of scarcity, and po such as not having mo money, how much does that impact your, your IQ? They did some tests. They took college students, you know, bright folks, they, and they would give them a test. They'd give them an IQ test, and they'd figure out, here's your IQ. And they'd give them another IQ test, but they'd tell them beforehand, I want you to think about your car breaking down on the way home, and you need to come up with $3,000 to fix it. Who here could write a check for $3,000 right now to fix your car? Don't tell me, but, you know, think about that. You kind of start thinking, could I write that check? Could I write that check? Where did I get the money? And, and as soon as people started worrying about money, their IQ dropped 14 points. Now, that's not like going from normal to needing special education, but 14 points, well, 100 is normal, 70 or below is special education, 120 and above, you start getting into really gifted. And so 14 points, that's the difference between understanding something and, huh, and struggling. That's a significant difference. And so what happens when people are in poverty in America, that there, or poverty anywhere, but we see people in poverty making decisions that are bad, and we say, oh, they must be in poverty because they've made bad decisions, and we get it backwards. Because they're in poverty, they make bad decisions. The poverty causes the bad decisions. The bad decisions doesn't cause, cause the poverty most often, because what happens is, it, it's, you, you know how sometimes you have a bad day at work, you go home, you're kind of short with, with your family? Did that ever happened to you? Maybe you're far better people than I am. It does happen to me. Imagine having a bad day at work permanently. Imagine always worrying about money. Imagine always being that at, at your job, sitting at your job, trying to figure out something complicated in the back of your mind. It's just sitting there running. Price of propane just went up. Can I afford to pr pay for my propane? Can I afford to pay child care? Can I afford to pay rent? And, and if you have that running in the back of your mind, can you focus and make a good decision? Well, it gets a lot harder. It gets significantly harder. And I was reading this book, thinking about this, thinking, wow, this is interesting. And then I talked to a friend of mine who's going through it. There's a friend of mine I went to college with, and this woman is smart. She is really, really smart. And, um, and she was working in a, a, a salary job and then she went to working as a paraprofessional at the school and then working at JC Penney's to make ends meet. And she, she was telling me just recently, she was telling me, Andy, I worry about money like I never have before in my life. I'm always thinking about it. I always want it. I always need it. I'm always worried about it and it's never happened to me before. This is someone I know who is really sharp and it's happening to her. And it's always running in the back of her mind now and it makes it harder for her to make a good decision. And so as I, as I learned this, as I studied this this week, I, I have a, a much deeper respect for anyone who can work a minimum wage job and hold together a family because it's just really hard. It's really hard. And so hopefully by now you're getting the sense that poverty is more than just a money issue. You just can't give people money and solve poverty. It's about an emotional issue. It's about a spiritual issue, about believing you're worth something. It's about social issues, about having friends and a safety net. Poverty is a situation that is often generational, and if it takes multiple generations to get into that problem, it's not going to get solved overnight, is it? And so what do we do in the face of such a problem? We can't throw up our hands in despair. Optimism seems a little bit much, but what we can do is be stubbornly hopeful. You know, Jesus got over being dead. We can solve problems. It's just a matter of getting committed and following Jesus and doing it. And so what Jesus says about how we are to love people is we are to love our neighbors. I mean, we say it all the time. Love our neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. But that is the Christian response to poverty. Love your neighbor. Now, now, we do need to get one thing out of, out of the way quickly. Whenever we start talking about helping people in poverty, one of the questions that comes up first is, do they deserve it? You ever hear someone ask that? Do they deserve the help? Let me ask you a question. Does anyone deserve to be your neighbor? Doesn't make sense, does it? Who are your neighbors? 
your neighbors. Do you get to pick them? Nope. They're your neighbors. And your neighbors are here in Milan, and you're, that's your neighborhood, right? Milan. You didn't get to pick it. You could move somewhere else, and you know what happened there? You'd have neighbors. You wouldn't pick them, and it'd be just the same, right? So the idea of trying to, to, to be, to love our neighbor, and trying to, to even begin to try to decide who deserves help, misses the point. We're not sent out to figure out who deserves. We're sent, sent out to love your neighbor. And whoever, whoever your neighbor is, that's, go for it. That's your neighbor, right? And so as a community uh, of neighbors, if we're going to love our neighbors, we can think about it much like that old adage about fishing, right? You give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime, right? There's a third step there. We as a community take responsibility to make sure there's enough fish in the pond. Because if I teach you to fish, you have to have the personal responsibility to get out there and do it. But we as a community have the responsibility to make sure that if you get out there to cast out and try to catch something, that, that there's something there to catch. That's our responsibility as a community. Make sure the pond is well stocked. What does the pond in Milan need? What, what's, what's our pond? If we're going to have a well-stocked pond, what does that need? Well, I'm going to make a guess, because every time I, I, I study this, every time I look at it, there are three things that always show up. What most ponds need, and I think this is probably the case in Milan too, is help for children, help for mothers, and jobs. Children, if you, the more education you get, the less likely you are to be in poverty. And so if we want to make sure to stock the pond well, we need to do what it takes to help children do well, have stability, be involved in school. Second, mothers. If we want the children to stay in school, the mothers have to be stable. The mothers have to be able to provide. If you look at single mothers who are head of households, right? Single mothers who are, have children, 58% of them are on low-wage jobs, which means they're spending a third of their income on child care. Can you imagine giving up a third of your income every paycheck? Let me tell you what it feels like. I'm paying a third of my income for insurance right now. It's going to change next month, thank God. You give up a third of your income, and it hurts, right? And so if we are going to stock the pond, take care of children, and help mothers with affordable daycare and, and jobs that are, are flexible and pay well. And then the third thing, jobs. If we want men to be able to stay around and have stable families, they have to have jobs to work that aren't going to go anywhere. Those are the three things. Ch children, mothers, and jobs. And so, uh, how do we go about doing this? This is what I want to, I gave you a, a bit of a handout. I invite you to put this in your Bible when you get home or put it on your fridge or do whatever you want to do with it. But this is sort of the, the rest of the sermon is right here because this, this gives you some guidelines for how to go about this, then some ideas for what you can do. First, when we get involved, we are sent out to be neighbors. And are, are, are your neighbors going to come up and knock on your door and say, can we be neighbors? No. Once upon a time, maybe, that doesn't happen anymore now, does it? And so if we're going to go be neighborly, we're not just going to go out and say, well, I'd like to be neighbors now. We have to go and be sent. You've got to go and be neighbors. So go be neighborly. Eat, drink together, celebrate together, grieve together. And then when you're being neighborly, don't do things for people that they can do for themselves. That might sound simple, but if you do things for people that they can do for themselves, what are they being taught? Come ask for help. Yep. That doesn't actually help them in the long run. Part of the, and this is the next thing, crisis versus chronic situations. If someone's in a crisis, we, we ought to and need to give. And what's a crisis? Your home burns down, your kid is sick, your, your car is broken. But if your car is broken every month, well, that turns into a chronic situation. And if you respond to, cri to chronic situations that happen all the time, like everyone's a crisis, you're not really helping, are you? Chronic, solution, chronic problems need chronic, ongoing chronic solutions. Respect a person's dignity. Often the trade we make, we ask people to make, is you trade your dignity and I will give you food. If you're not willing to be treated in the exact same way you're treating the person in need, well, you need to rethink that then. Set aside our agenda for the agenda of, of the needy. What is, what their, what is their need? And above all, do no harm. 
And so if you take these guidelines and you're going to go out into Milan and do something, I'm going to tell you what we might do individually and then maybe a few thoughts on what we can do as a church. Individually, we can go out and mentor children. You go to Jill Herring or you go up to the school and say, I want to mentor a child who needs a hand. They'll take you up on it. It might be one child, but you know what that is? That is one child more than was being loved and cared for yesterday. Share meals. Go out, be neighborly, share a meal with folks. And if you don't know them all that well, just take them out to Gordo's. It's a nice public place. You don't have to worry about anything. And the food's pretty good, too. Share meals. Be, be neighbors. Get to know your neighbors. Get involved in the food pantry at, at Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H, FFA, whatever you, you can do. Uh, babysit. If, if one of the biggest needs for working mothers is dependable, flexible, and affordable child care, how many of y'all could babysit? Y'all could do it. I mean, you don't have, and you could set up, you didn't have to do it like, I'll babysit every day forever, but you could set up shifts. I mean, this is entirely possible. Y'all know how to look after a kid and change a diaper. And finally, create jobs. Some of us are gifted with the ability to run a business and create jobs and, and, and go do it. Every, uh, the long term permanent solution to poverty is a job. And so, if you have any ability to create a job, please do so. And then what can we do as a church is actually when we get together, we can multiply what we can do and do far more. We can help each other discern when to say yes and when to say no as we talk to each other. We can create ways to help that are dignified. For example, what would it look like if this church, instead of doing adopt a child next year, you know how adopt a child works? You, you get a list, you buy stuff, and then you show up and, and you give and you feel good. And what is the what's the family's experience? The children see that gifts come from, for, that parents aren't bringing their gifts. The, the children see that other people bring them gifts so that their parents aren't providing. The moms are just trying to scrounge. And what, is it, what does it feel like to be a dad and you can't provide for your family? That, it just doesn't work. And so what if instead of doing that, we said, everyone donate a gift. We'll set up a store, maybe in the basement of the church, maybe somewhere else. We'll sell those toys at garage sale prices. And then we need someone to work the store. Well, let's hire someone. We've just created a job. Someone can get experience running a little bit of a store. And parents can show up and buy something for their kids and wrap it themselves. And then they have the dignity of providing for their children. Now, that sounds a lot better than adopt a child, doesn't it? And it takes some work, but it's work worth doing. Those are the type of things that, as a church, we could do. You want A food pantry is great. You know what's better? A co-op. Be it, so where people can throw their money in together and then one person among them goes off and buys the food and so that people learn to take responsibility and are committed to a group that they are running themselves. That's a long-term solution. <clears throat> when, when we commit to being involved in this way and we are being neighbors and we are connected to people, not only can we put together programs like that, we can just become the safety net for people who need a hand. So often people fall into poverty because they don't have someone right there when an emergency happens. We can be the safety net for people and, and you know, and we can also step up and say things local and local politics. You know, People in poverty tend to spend about 5% of income on reconnect fees, overdraft fees, and the like. They spend 5% of their income on fees. That's a lot. What would it look like to go to the city council and say, if you're below the poverty line, could we stop charging reconnect fees? I mean, you're already down. Could we stop kicking? I mean, that's the type of thing we as a church could show up and say. And the future mayor of, the, of this town is here in this church. We just don't know which one yet. So we'll have some... Well, they'll at least let us talk. <laughs> so, I mean, and these are the types of ideas we can do. Um, and these are just the beginning. This is just what I have come up with, with a, a week of chewing on this. If you want to be involved and nothing here trips your trigger, come talk with me and we'll read coffee and pray. And I firmly believe that when people sit down and read coffee and pray, that's when the world changes. That's when we pray and we decide God is calling us to do something and, and what are we going to do? It's just a matter of figuring out what's, what's next. I, there was a time in my life when I was deeply involved in poverty ministry. I spent about two years doing that and it was some of the hardest stuff I've ever done. It was deeply satisfying and I miss the friendships I have. That's the one thing that I, I just deeply miss. The middle class, remember, is all about things and the lower class is about relationships. I learned so much about being a friend when I was on the streets of Durham. 
talking to my friends. I miss that, and I want to experience that again. But now I'm a pastor, right? And so the best I can do is say, it's out there, it's waiting, if you go out and be neighbors and, and bring me along, because I miss it. Go out and be neighbors. You want to make a difference about poverty in America, go out and be a neighbor. Amen.